Hello, friends. Hello, parents. Hello, grandparents. Uh, I bet you're like me and you're stuck inside your house right now during this uh, era of social distancing and quarantining. And you're being asked to do this new job at home with your children or your grandchildren, that of supporting them in mathematics. And I know for some of you that might make you scared. And I wanted to give you a video today to talk about um, what is mathematics? Because if you're being asked to support it, it starts with one of the basics of knowing what it is. And most people that I meet don't know what mathematics is. So I wanted you to be in that group that actually knows what that looks like. My name is Sarah Vanderf, and I live uh, and am speaking to you from Minneapolis, Minnesota. I have a calculator museum with over 35 calculators in it. I also don't know how to ride a regular bike. The only bike I know how to ride is something called a backwards bike. You can Google it if you don't know what that is. And I train teachers for a living and I write about mathematics at sarahvanderf.com. And most of the people that I meet most of the students, more than two thirds of the people have some kind of negative reaction when it comes to math. And this is the gift that I show my students on day two every year. And I say, this gift has something to do with math. And by the end of the hour, I want you to tell me what that is. But that thing that has to do with math is not what you think. Math does not leave a sour taste in your ma uh, mouth and make you feel bad. I want you to feel good about math. So in a little bit, I will tell you for you watching this video, that's in about two minutes what this has to do with math. So before I tell you what math is and what that baby eating a lemon has to do with math, I want you to think in your head, if I had you right now say out loud what the definition of math is, what would you say? Like, think about it. What is math? Well, I've asked this questions of thousands of educators, like 10,000 educators, leaders, adults, but I've also asked thousands of students over the last 20 years in my classroom because the first uh, homework that I give every school year is I ask them to define math. Uh, and on the second day of school, I collect their responses. And this is from my most recent Algebra 2 classroom. This is what my student says. And for the last 20 years, it's been very consistent that students say this is what math is. And if you look at this list, maybe there's something on this list that you think we're thinking in your head when I asked you to define mathematics. Well, certainly a lot of the things over here have a relationship to mathematics, but they're not the definition of mathematics. If you were to Google the word math, and I Googled the word math, and I went to Google Images, and these are the first pictures that show up, you'll see some of the same things from those image uh, that list that my students created. There are numbers and variables and equations and graphs and shapes, and math has been boiled down to a bunch of uh, disconnected things, but that's not math. That's not the definition of math. If you Google math GIF, it doesn't get any better. They're just now all those things are spinning around people's heads and like going off into the air. And so movies portray math in a certain way. And the way that it's portrayed has a lot to do with how we were taught. A lot of us were taught the same way. Um, it was a teacher up in front of the classroom and they would say, today we're gonna learn about blank um, and we're going to uh, get out your notebook and write this down and we go in and do a bunch of things and memorize all this and then go do a bunch of worksheets um, on this thing. In fact, that's how I was taught. I grew up in the 70s and 80s. That's me from kindergarten through 11th grade. I know I'm really cute. Um, and I was taught that way. And my ideas of math for a long time looked like that until I went to school to be a math teacher. And I started teaching math. And my idea of mathematics really transformed. Because here's how most of us learn math. Let me know if you were like me by commenting <laughs> below. We would be given a definition of mathematics um, you know, in our classroom, say, get out your notebook and write this down. Here's what a polygon is. Memorize if it's a polygon, if blank, blank, blank. And we draw some pictures. And then I would go and memorize it. And then I'd regurgitate it on the test. Or maybe uh, it was a day where we were learning about the exterior angle sum of polygons. And they would have us draw this picture. We'd draw in all those green exterior angles and then we'd write down that blue statement that says the exterior angles of any polygon add up to 360. And again, I would memorize it for a test. I would do worksheets where I would you know, be given four of the five angles of the Pentagon and I would add them up and subtract from 360 and I could do it at the time. But when I hadn't been studying that in a long time, and long time might only be a couple weeks, I would forget these things and I wouldn't have a way of recreating it. So um, we define the math this way. So if this is not what math is, 
what is math? Well, on the second day of school, I give my students a definition of math that I'm gonna give you now. And that's the definition that I use that will carry us through the rest of the year in math. And my classroom, my math experience, and this is what I hope your child's experience is and what I'd love for you to support is based on this definition, that math is the study of patterns. Math Maddox is a study of patterns and relationships, and that's studying the, our whole world. Our world is made of structure and patterns and uh, relationships. That's why people say math is everywhere. And a mathematics is uh, a mathematician is someone who studies patterns. Well, I know I've given you a definition of mathematics, and you're like, well, that's great, Saria. So what does it mean to give my child, my grandchild, some patterns, and how do I help them study it? Well, you got to know what the job of a mathematician is. And so it's really simple. Again, I tell my students this. It's only three things. And I say, these are the three things you're going to do in math class every single day. So as mathematicians, this is my ask of you in the classroom is that you do three things. Number one, that you notice patterns. And as a teacher and as a, I'm asking you as a parent or a grandparent, you want to, when you're supporting them with math or doing things that could cultivate a mathematician persona, I'll give you some ideas on that in a minute. Uh, you are going to ask the question like I do, what do you notice? What's the same? What's different? What's going on there? What do you notice? The second thing mathematicians need to do. So your student, your child, your grandchild needs to be describing those things that they notice. Mathematicians, they describe patterns. The third thing mathematicians do is we generalize those patterns. And that one is definitely the hardest, but you can get better at it. I did not know how to ride a backwards bike and I set out to learn it. It took me a year to learn and for the first six months, I couldn't even make a rotation and it took me a long time. The good news is these three parts of being a mathematician are very quick and easy to instill in your child. And maybe you even as adult, you can uh, need to reframe your mind. There's some great news about this. Here's the great news. I'm going to start with that red noticing and patterns. Because you need some great news because you're like, eh, I've never thought about math this way. Well, remember that baby with the lemon? Look at all these babies eating lemons. Look at their faces. They all make the same face when they eat a lemon and something sour. Their parents didn't teach them how to make this face. Like that is innate from the day they were born. This face when they eat something sour is the face that they're going to make. And so here's what we know from the research about how the brain is formed. From the day you were born, you were a mathematician. From the day you were born, you had the ability to notice patterns. So all kinds of people tell me I can't do math and I can't do all these things. Well, you are defining math as memorizing a bunch of things and remembering those things. That's not math. What math is, is noticing, describing, and generalizing. And the research says you're wrong. You can do math because you have the ability to notice patterns from birth. So here's the first sequence that I often give people after I've given them the definition. This is one you could use with your children, or I can just use it for you right now. And I say, we're going to practice the three parts of being a mathematician. So I start by saying, what do you notice? And I ask them to look at this sequence of numbers and notice things, and they will yell out, ah, eight and 10. And I don't tell them yes or no, it's eight and 10. Instead, I ask them, well, why do you think it's eight and 10? Tell me more about that. I'm asking them to describe and they will say things like, well, the sequence is going up by two. They don't use the word sequence, um, but it's going up by two and then we're adding two each time. And then they'll start to form generalizations, things like to get the next number in the sequence, you add two to the previous term. And eventually those generalizations will start to be made more efficient um, and we involve variables and do some things with that. That is mathematics. The process of going through that, that is mathematics. By the way, I love this sequence because 8 and 10 are not the only answers. 10 and 16 could easily go in there. And if I was to ask the students, why do you see 10 and 16? They would probably say something like this. Well, I noticed that when you added 2 and 4, the first two terms, you got 6. So then they'll start to generalize this to say to get the next uh, number in the sequence, the next term in the sequence, you would add the previous term. So 4 plus 6 is 10, and 6 plus 10 is 16, and so on and so on. That, my friends, is mathematics. So what does mathematics look like uh, when you're at home? 
So this is my youngest nephew, and this is at my parents' home. And my mom sent me this picture and told me this story um, of something that happened in her house. And my youngest nephew was pointing at her wall, and he noticed something on her wall. And he said to my mother, Grandma, look, that's not right. Well, he was looking at this. Can you tell what is not right in this picture? Well, my mom said to him, well, what isn't right? And he said, it's missing the bump. And he was talking about the fact that Minnesota, which in fact does have a little bump at the top of its shape, was missing from the picture that was on her wall. Now you might wonder um, why he was able to notice that. Well, we have that ability since the day that we were born. And this is what's in my youngest nephew's uh, bedroom and his bathroom. And he's been noticing the things that his parents put in front of him. Now, they're not teaching him how to draw the shapes. Uh, they might have said, you know, pointed at Minnesota and said, that's the state that you live on. But he is a mathematician from birth. Our uh, students are mathematicians. Your child is a mathematician. We've just not been making math about math, which is noticing and then giving them an opportunity to describe. My mom did the right thing. She created a mathematician and said, what do you mean it's not right? And tell me about that. And gave him a chance to describe in his words where eventually he, uh, he can generalize things. So as you're supporting your students in their mathematics, if you're supporting, for instance, uh, a middle school or a high schooler, and they're working on the exterior angle sum of polygons, I hope their teacher is giving them experiences like I do and not asking them to write this down and memorize it and do a bunch of worksheets, but instead giving them opportunities to look at something and to notice and describe what they um, see. So this is a gift that I've used in my classroom. And I want my students to say that all the outside angles come together to form a circle and a circle has 360 degrees. And so all those outside angles, doesn't matter how many sides are in the shape, they come together. Rather than uh, your child copying down uh, definitions of polygon, and if they don't know what a polygon is, you're like, oh, let me tell you all about it. And you, and, you know, you feel like you need to do that. And that's why some parents feel like they can't do this. Don't worry about that. Instead, we want to create the experiences where they are we're asking them to notice for example this is one that I use in my class and if you look over here these are polygons and these are not I don't tell my students that but I do ask them to notice what's the same and different on both side and to describe to me what's the same and different and guess what they say all the qualities of the polygons and then I tell them these are polygons and so what is a polygon and they own that understanding because I didn't say it, they created that meaning. That's what it means to create mathematicians. So how can you support that if you're at home with your children? Well, it starts with really simple things. You don't have to do all their homework for them. You need to create experiences. So this is my dad and my nephews. If you are at home right now, play games, play board games, play card games, play uh, any game that has any type of logic, there's tons of free ones out there um, and a little bit of skill and luck and all those things and just play games with them and then have a conversation. And when they say, I'm going to play this card, ask them, why did you choose that card? Uh, and just, you don't have to say you're doing math, but you're creating mathematicians. In fact, my mom said that when my dad introduced his favorite game to my nephews, they look like this for over an hour, no fighting or anything. Our students love to do mathematics. If you have puzzles, do puzzles. This is my middle nephew. He loved puzzles. This is one of the world that they put together. And when I showed up, it fell apart um, all over the middle. And he put like probably 50 pieces back together really, really quickly because he had been staring at it. He also had been asking about all the countries that you see there. And so he was able to tell me all these things. It wasn't like my... Um, sister-in-law set out to teach him all these things. It was just an experience that happened. And as you're doing that, you're creating mathematicians. You can cook with your children. And as you're doing that, and they're like, just ask them to describe and tell you what they're noticing and doing in that experience. Um, maybe you have something around your house that you can count. You have a lot of beans or paper clips or Legos like it that are at my nephew's house. You can sort or classify or count or do things with that. If you said how many Legos are there, then ask, why do you think there's that many Legos and get them to describe what's going on? If you need some ideas on this, um, I'll link below several resources for you, but one of them is this great website called Games for Young Minds. It's run by my friend Kent in Alabama. Um, and let's say your child uh, built this set of Legos. He has a recent blog post that suggests the three best math questions to ask your kids about 
that picture, or in his case, he had pictures of goldfish lined up. It's to ask them, well, how many Legos do you think are there? What do you think? What's the number of Legos? And when they say a number, don't confirm it. Instead say, how do you know? You're getting them to describe the relationships and the structure and the patterns that exist there and what are your strategies um, so you can do this with anything um, if you need some ideas kent writes about all his kids and how to do this and he has tons of game selection uh suggestions for you and ways that you can do it another great site that i'll link below is from my fa uh, friend fawn win she has this great website called visualpatterns.org and at the site there's over 300 of uh, pictures that look something like this where there's a series of three uh, pictures and you're asked to figure out how many of the thing in this case ducks how many ducks would be in the 43rd shape I don't know why she uses 43 uh, all the time but students have to start looking at that picture your child you could do as a family one of these a night like you read a book each night you could pick a pattern each night and play around with it and you ask your students when they say by the way if you have elementary students then talk about what the fourth picture looks like or the fifth picture. And they might talk about, they saw and counted the number of ducks because they saw a square and then they added up the extras. Or maybe they saw a rectangle and then they eliminated the one missing one in each of those things. As they start to describe those patterns, they're uh, developing algebraic skills. Um, and again, at her site, she has over uh, 300 of them. So I know a lot of what you think you should be doing is supporting your students as they're working either on paper or on a computer on the math that their teachers are assigning them as they're at home uh, right now. And the good news is you don't have to be able to do all the math. You don't have to remember it all. You need to just simply ask my favorite questions. What do you think? What do you notice? And you're asking them to describe because if you jump in and tell them how to do it, they will remember it for the next 24 or 48 hours, but then they're gonna forget it. And you're wanting to create mathematicians. If you're both stuck, then there's another really cool thing you can do. I love Google. We live in the era of this. In fact, Siri can do all the math that I learned when I was in school. And so you're going to ask your child to Google things that they don't know how to do and you Google it with them. And so I always recommend uh, putting the word math. I didn't on this particular one, but if it's a word, uh, a word that you're Googling, throw the word math into the search engine. And then what I recommend is clicking on Google Images and then picking something that you find in Google Images that's uh, interesting to you. For example, I picked the picture that the arrow's pointing at. I'll make that bigger for you. And then as a parent, you're going to say to your child, hey, what do you notice about this? What do you think a perimeter might be? And have them form it rather than you just telling them it's a distance around something. Uh, a, a shape. So as you're at home, I'm going to ask you to consider making mathematicians. And to make mathematicians, your child needs to do three things. They need to be given opportunities all the time to notice patterns and relationships, to describe them, and to generalize them. That's what math looks like in my classroom, even though I'm doing those same three things with logarithms and quadratic uh, functions and all kinds of other things. Mathematics is the study of patterns and relationships, and I'd like you to join me. I'll give you a few resources that I'll link, uh, including those two that I mentioned before. I'm also gonna link another five minute video if you wanna uh, hear from a huge expert on noticing. Her name's Annie Federer. Um, and then I write about all these things at my website, sarahvandorf.com. So thanks, stay safe out there um, and work on changing how your brain views mathematics as you support your children, your grandchildren, or whoever else is in your life. Bye.